Okay. It's time. It is time for our final talk of the conference before the lightning talks. Uh, this talk comes with twice the number of presenters. Uh, we have Becky Smith and Simon Davey, and they will be talking about Open Safely, a Python-powered response to the COVID pandemic. Now, they won't be taking uh, questions, but you can come and talk to them later. Let's give them a big hand. Uh, hello, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Uh, mics are difficult when you're um, a foot shorter than your co-presenter. Um, <laughs> so I guess a bit of a content warning. We are going to talk about the COVID pandemic. Hopefully that's obvious. Um, if that's a problem, feel free to, to step out. So um, we are software developers at the Bennett Institute for Applied Data Science, um, which is at the University of Oxford, and we're led by Professor Ben Goldacre. Uh, we work with a team of um, professional developers, clinicians, and academics, and we pull skills, knowledge, and best practice from each of these three disciplines. We're going to talk to you today about a project called Open Safely. Um, we also work on other projects that contribute to the better use of data, evidence, and digital tools. Um, you can go and take a look at those on our website if you'd like to. So, um, in one sentence, OpenSafely is a secure, transparent, open source software platform for the analysis of electronic health data written in Python, built as a response to the COVID emergency. It's a collaboration between um, the Bennett Institute, the EHR research group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's taken me a year to be able to say that. Um, <laughs> and uh, TPP and DEMIS, who are companies that already manage NHS patients' records. Um, they work on behalf of NHS England and NHS X. Uh, first, a bit of a disclaimer. There's gonna be very little code in this talk. Um, instead, we'd like to take you on a journey through the development of Open Safely in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll talk about why it was needed, and the heroic efforts of multiple teams to create it within the timelines that the pandemic required. So, our story begins back in January 2020, a time you might remember. So December 2019 had seen reports of an outbreak of a viral pneumonia in, in China. Um, that was confirmed by the World Health Organization on the 9th of January. Uh, on the 29th, we had the first confirmed case in the UK, and by the 31st, the WHO had confirmed a global health emergency. So at this point of time, um, no one really knew what was going on. There was the prospect of national lockdowns, uh, the start of restrictions on international travel. Um, Organisations were starting to encourage people to work from home. And the Bennett Institute team were largely in the same boat as everyone else. However, we knew that high quality data analysis was, was going to be an essential component of the national response to the pandemic. And we also knew that the team had the skills and the experience to help make best use of the data. So the 2nd of March saw the first recorded death in the UK. Uh, the red line at the bottom of the slide shows you how those numbers rapidly began to rise. So this, this is showing um, daily, daily deaths um, within the UK within 28 days of a positive COVID test. Uh, on the 11th of March, the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Uh, two days later, members of our team published a blog post in the, in the British Medical Journal, which offered ideas on better use of data and technologies to address COVID-19. So this blog post didn't come out of nowhere. We'd been thinking about these problems and these challenges for a while, uh, and we knew it was gonna be important. But why, why couldn't we just use existing infrastructure that was already in place? Um, the NHS has a vast amount of data, and it, it is incredibly useful and detailed and can solve, uh, answer all kinds of questions that we might have about this uh, on the ground developing situation. But there were, 
a number of problems with how you can use and access that at the time. It often suffered from closed working models where uh, different groups would be working on different things and not be necessarily sharing their code or their methods for sometimes valid reasons. Um, and uh, because it was isolated, uh, there was uh, less standardization than you might like. Um, and there was lots of different systems, different data, different slices and cuts of data. Not all data had the whole picture. Um, and uh, a lot of it was looking at like systems analysis and performance and less on actual clinical intervention. Um, I have mentioned that already. And one other aspect was that it was slow. Often you might request to get some data and it might take three months, six months before you actually had the data. And on a developing pandemic situation, that was not fast enough. Uh, all these um, various limitations that added up to a lack of public trust and confidence in the NHS data systems, which you may have seen in news articles and things around over the, over the, over the years. Um, and uh, we knew if, it was, if we were going to actually be able to use this data to answer these important questions, we needed to address these problems. Uh, yeah, I'll mention that. So how can we make it better? Well, there are some basics that are kind of obvious uh, when you think about them, it's stated very simply. So it needs to be collected, we need to have accurate data, it needs to be secure, it needs to be analysed safely, and by that we mean that we, the right people are able to look at the data and nothing is uh, disclosed in any publications that come out of it, and communicated effectively. And the most important thing, this is my data, it's your data, it's my parents' data, it's my children's data, it is our data, and the, uh, we must absolutely, the, the absolute goal of uh, the fundamental principle of all our work was to protect privacy. Now, a common tool that is used to do this is pseudonymization. This is where you obscure some of the details of the data. So you don't have names, you don't have addresses, but maybe you have a region where someone lives and all these kind of things. And while that does protect against mass trivial re-identification, it does not protect very well against targeted re-identification of data. So if you know a few details about somebody that might appear on their record, it's relatively easy to actually identify their record from that data. So it's not enough. And in fact, we should really be treating pseudonymized data with the same level of privacy restrictions as we treat fully uh, um, uh, identifiable data. And this is a big topic. If you are interested to read more, uh, earlier this year, well, last year, the government asked uh, Ben Goldaters to lead a review of data science use in the, in the NHS uh, and data. And earlier this year, that review was published. Um, there's a short summary that explained a lot of things, and it goes into a massive amount of detail with 185 recommendations. If you would like to learn more about this, we recommend reading that. It's really, really interesting stuff. And that goes more into more detail about this specific problem. Um, so, on the 17th of March, Bennett team met to generate some ideas on how we could help with the COVID emergency. Uh, those ideas included things like developing um, dashboards of medicine shortages, tracking the spread of misinformation, and, but it also included the first incarnation of Open Safely. So this was the notion of a platform that would facilitate what researchers were going to need, fast, secure access to large volumes of COVID-related health data. Um, the next day, uh, Ben Goldacre from the Bennett Institute and Liam Smith from LSHTM wrote to the government and the, and the NHS outlining a proposal for a platform that was designed from the start to allow faster, better, more efficient use of data while ensuring that patients' privacy was preserved. Um, and that was the key element. We wanted to move beyond slow, intermittent, insecure data extraction and towards a better, faster, more efficient means to work with raw NHS data. And so the principles behind this uh, whole idea can be summed up here. Privacy being principle number one, as we've already mentioned, uh, it must protect that. There should be uh, limited or no access to the raw, even pseudonymized data. And anything that is uh, released from this platform needs to be reviewed manually for potential disclosive information. Another key aspect for us was one of transparency. So all of the platform code is open source. Um, all of the analysis code 
is or will be open source. Um, sometimes when uh, studies are being developed, they're developed in private, but the condition of using the platform is after the study is finished, then the, the, the source has to be uh, made open and we control that. Um, and uh, now this is a little bit different uh, in many ways from traditional open source. We're not encouraging you to download and run open safely. Uh, it's a, a, an open platform, if you will. And the reason we publish all the source uh, in public is, is so you can go in and look at it. And a bunch of people here would be, I'm sure, very interested to go and poke around in our code and check it, we're doing what we say we're doing. Um, um, another principle is reproducibility. And now Vincent went into this a little bit yesterday in his talk, and this is very important to us. We want to be able to uh, reproduce the experiments we've done against later sets of data. We'd love for other people against other data sets to be able to reproduce our data. That's another reason why it's all open. And we even have done some reproduction studies internally. We have, as we mentioned, we've got TPP and EMIS with two different data sets, and we've run the same studies against both of them to confirm that they're, what we get is matching up in two different companies' data sets. Um, and collaboration is very important as well. And this was one of the, uh, the shortcomings uh, that was in the current approaches. We wanted to share code, we wanted uh, researchers to be able to read each other's code to see how they'd worked and collaborate on new methods and new ideas and develop best practice. And another real aspect uh, that was important, especially in the pandemic, was speed. We needed real-time access to data. We needed to know what was happening on the ground as the, as the pandemic developed. And we needed to have up-to-date test results, up-to-date everything. And so it had to be fast. We had to have that access. And also, it needed to be fast to develop on as well. We have a, a, an iteration cycle. We need to be able to query and refine our query and produce results, results quickly because uh, there were questions that needed answering. Uh, so in summary, if I was going to summar summarize all this, it would be we, we are accessing this data by protecting patients' privacy, and part of how we do that is make everything as open as possible and as transparent as possible so that anyone can inspect what we're doing. Uh, so, back to our timeline. We're still in March 2020. Things are moving quickly on Open Safely, but so is the pandemic. So, on the 20th of March, the team first floated the idea of collaborating on Open Safely to TPP. So, TPP, as we've discussed, is a company that holds and manages um, data for the NHS. They, they hold approximately 40% of patient data in England, um, which is, that's the full GP records for approximately 17 million people. Uh, on the same day, special copy notices were issued by the Secretary's, Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, um, and that gave us the legal basis for accessing data on, on behalf of NHS England. Um, the COVID situation continued to develop at an alarming rate. Um, so the first UK lockdown was announced on the 23rd of March, and, the legis and legislation came into effect on the 26th. But with the um, optimistic expectation that all the moving parts necessary for Open Safely would come together, the first commit to the first repo was made on the 30th of March, and the team started to build tools for data management and analysis. Um, by the 14th of April, we had all the ethics approvals and agreements in place, um, and by the end of April, all the initial infrastructure was in place to run first analysis in, on TPP data. Um, so there's not a lot of words on the slide, but there's a lot going on in, in the background. So this is just a month after uh, we first, the, after the first commit to the code base. Um, this represents a huge amount of work across multiple teams and multiple organizations. Um, and it's not just the platform infrastructure and code, but all the paperwork, all the, all the approvals to allow it to run. So just to give you an overview of how things looked in this early stage, um, we wanted uh, developers to be able to write their code on their own laptop away from the data um, so that they could collaborate, so they could um, work on that code together and test it locally before running it in the secure uh, uh, data, uh, server. And so we did that by packaging up a bunch of Docker images with different uh, scientific environments on Python R and, St uh, and Stata. Uh, which is a commonly used tool in epidemiology. And on the user's local machine, we developed a tool with a Python API where they could define what they were interested in looking at, what uh, aspects of, of 
uh, what variables they were interested in extracting from uh, the population they had chosen to, to do. And the reason we did this was we allowed them to also define uh, some expectations about what that data would look like, which we could then use to generate dummy data locally. So they could vet that their code was running, it was working, it was uh, running against a dummy data set and would work, uh, or had a higher chance of working when they ran it against the real data set. And they would manually run these Docker images. We had to teach a, a lot of research scientists how to use Docker, which was fun. Um, uh, all this is pushed and collaborated and reviewed and shared up to uh, uh, GitHub. We have an open safety organization where all this work takes place. And then uh, initially, in that uh, initial rush to get things set up, uh, TPP provided an environment for us to execute within uh, their infrastructure. And users would manually log in with a, over a VPN with two-factor authentication. They would then manually check out that GitHub code that they had written, and they would run it manually again with Docker images, but this time it would run against the real data. Um, and then uh, any outputs would be uh, uh, reviewed and pushed up to GitHub. Uh, and that was the initial uh, state of things to get things off the ground quickly. The key element here was this Python API, and here's a, a quick snippet from one of these early studies. Uh, creatinine is a chemical in the body which is often an indication of uh, kidney problems. And so if you're interested in looking at that, you might say, um, I want all these people with these ranges with a creatinine test in their records. And here at the bottom where it says return expectations, that's how you would define how you would expect the data to look so that can generate the dummy data. And this abstraction over the data is one of the key things that has enabled a lot of the work we've done. So on the 7th of May, that's, that's just seven weeks after the very first proposal of even trying to do such a thing, our collaborative group published the first preprint of our first ever Open Safely paper, describing analysis into who's most at risk of COVID-19 related death. Uh, this was the largest study of its kind to date. It analyzed NHS health data from 17.4 million adults across, uh, across England between the 1st of February and the 25th of April 2020. Um, it found evidence that key factors related to COVID-19 death included gender, age, uncontrolled diabetes, and severe asthma. Um, there were other factors, so deprivation was found to be a major risk factor, um, and ethnicity was a very important factor. There was a, a significant impact of ethnicity, and contrary to, to earlier hypotheses, that wasn't attributable to other background medical factors. Um, so. Bear in mind, this is still May 2020. We didn't know much about COVID at that point. Uh, we had no vaccines. No one really knew what was going to happen. These sorts of findings were only possible due to the unprecedented volume of data that researchers had access to via OpenSafely. Uh, this is how Ben announced it on Twitter. Um, and uh, this tweet from <laughs> later in the thread, I think sums up the emotions that at the time, the, the amount of work, the amount of collaboration involved, and what an achievement it was in such a short, short space of time. Um, if you can't read it at the back, uh, he said, God, I need a sandwich. <laughs> I'll explain in a moment how we did it. This is the hardest, fastest, most amazing project I've ever been a part of across many organizations. Must eat. Barely stop for six weeks. Back in a mo. <laughs> um, which is typical of Ben. I would follow him on Twitter if you don't already. Um, so that was our first important paper, but there was a lot more to be done and a lot more data to investigate. So on the 16th of June, we entered into an agreement with EMIS, who were the other big data manager for the NHS. Um, and with this, OpenSafely can potentially run on more than 55 million patient records. That's more than 95% of all patient data in England. Um, in the next few months, we continued to um, build the platform tools. The team grew in both developers and researchers. We investigated uh, more clinical questions and published more papers. Um, we continued to, um, we started to collaborate with people outside of Bennett Institute and LH LSHTM um, and to develop tools to support that collaboration. Uh, so by the 1st of October, we had approximately 20 open safely repos that represent individual research studies. Um, and in October, we released our jobs website, which is backed by our job runner service, and that manages the execution of analysis 
jobs in the secure server and makes it easier for um, external users to collaborate with us. So now our architecture uh, looks more like this. We're still using Docker as our platform for uh, making sure we've got the same environment on uh, the user's machines and in production. We've improved our uh, developer tooling. We have a, a, a YAML file, which everybody loves to use, uh, to uh, chain dependencies together between different jobs and an open safety tool. Uh, all this is automatically tested on GitHub when they push to it. Uh, and we have extensively developed our documentation and continue to iterate on that. We're still using GitHub as the primary method of publication and collaboration. And we now have this job site, which acts to manage projects and users. They, they, have, they don't have to log in to run code anymore. They can submit there, and they can view any released outputs. And this site is our public audit trail. So you can go to it now, and you can see what projects have been approved, um, what jobs are running, uh, and if, if, the, uh, if, the, if, it was, if it's been published, then you'll be able to look at the code that was run uh, historically. And that's a very important part of the, the platform. And we've improved uh, how things run in the back end. We have the job runner service. Uh, users do still log in manually to look at their outputs, but they no longer have access to the raw pseudonymized data, which was always the goal. They actually now have only access to the aggregated outputs of their jobs, uh, and they can request that those are reviewed and are released. We use a process that is defined by the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, on proper review of, uh, of releasing data. Uh, for that, and they can submit those, and we have a team of reviewers that can review them. And this is just a so this is the uh, when I took a screenshot of the latest five jobs, you can see we've got a job running, we've got a job waiting to run, and we've got some jobs failing. So you can dig in and click on these links and dig down and explore, and I invite you to do so. So, in the latter part of 2020, we continued to respond to the ongoing COVID situation. Um, in November, uh, COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths were rising again. The UK entered its second uh, lockdown. Uh, to most people's relief, the, the, the first COVID vaccine was approved on the 2nd of December, um, and the vaccine rollout program began on the 8th. Um, so with access to near real-time patient data, researchers working with OpenSafely were able to provide rolling reports of the progress of the national vaccination program. Our first vaccine coverage report was published on the 21st of January, just six weeks after the program began. Um, so the reports describe patterns of vaccine coverage across demographics and clinical groups. And this is just an example chart from an early report uh, that shows the difference in vaccine coverage between ethnic groups in the 80 plus age range. Um, up until a few months ago, these were updated on a, on a weekly basis. Onwards into 2021, um, on the 19th of February, we, we ran the first federated analysis. Um, that's running the same analyses across record, <coughs> records held in both EMIS and TPP. Um, and on the 9th of April, the first federated vaccine coverage report was produced. That, allowed us to look at vaccine coverage across almost the entire English population. Um, our research has also led to some clinical intervention measures. Um, so uh, warfarin is a medication that's used to treat blood clots and reduce the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Um, during the pandemic, there was national guidance issued that, that recommended switching patients off warfarin and onto direct oral anticoagulants um, where it was safe to do so. Um, DOACs require less frequent blood testing, so it, the, the aim was to relie relieve some pressure on the health service. Um, they're not recommended for patients with mechanical heart valves. Uh, so we did a federated uh, analysis of DOAC prescribing, which found patients who were still on mechanical heart, heart valves who had been switched, um, and that led to the data providers de-identifying and issuing alerts to affected patients' clinicians. Um, in 2021, we continue to, to support research into urgent clinical questions around COVID, um, as well as analyses with policy impl implications, uh, like the impact of lockdowns on NHS services and the progress of the vaccine rollout. Um, I realize you can't read this, but everything is linked in there, and we'll make the slides available later. 
Um, in 2022, we've also continued to grow and develop both the, both the platform and the research that it makes possible. So we've added more data sets and we're continuing to investigate essential COVID-related questions. Um, so we've looked into the waning of vaccine effectiveness, the effectiveness of boosters, COVID, COVID treatments and long COVID. Um, we have supported many projects, published many papers and everything is available on GitHub for you to, to go and look at. So finally, what have we learned? So Open Safely was a huge and ambitious undertaking. It was only possible because of a collaboration of a wide range of teams working together towards a common goal. Uh, the future of health analytics is bright and it depends on this sort of multidisciplinary approach to leverage the expertise of specialists all working together. Doing things the right way sometimes make, means making things harder for your users. No one denies that it's much easier to work with pseudonymized data that you're allowed to download directly onto your laptop. However, if your users share your goals, they're prepared to work with you, um, not only regarding privacy and protection of patient data, but also in adopting good software practices of openness, code review, documentation, testing, and reusability. Um, and finally, we'd just like to leave you with this quote from the Goldacre Review, which I think illustrates uh, why OpenSafely is such an important platform and why we're so proud that we get the opportunity to work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be around. We'll be around um, after the lightning talks at lunch if anyone has any questions. Yes. Yeah, so just to remind, we're not taking questions now, but let's just say thank you for your work and thank you for your talk.